Vanessa and I have some exciting news for you. Starting now, you can listen to Cults episodes that are older than six months completely ad-free, exclusively on Stitcher Premium. We're always looking for ways to improve the listener experience. We found an amazing partner in Stitcher to bring you episodes ad-free six months after they're released. Again, this will only affect episodes that are older than six months. Nothing else will change. We'll still be releasing new Cults episodes wherever you listen to podcasts. For a free month trial, go to stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. That's stitcherpremium.com slash parcast and use promo code parcast. Moscow, 1961, the heart of the Soviet Union and the height of the Cold War. Across the globe, countries sat on the edge of their seats, awaiting total nuclear Armageddon. The world had been divided in two, the East and the West, both warring for supremacy. For those in the Soviet Union, it was an era of struggle, a battle between classic ideals and a call for reform. The system floundered, the economy was sinking, civil rights were non-existent, and spirituality was essentially extinct. The people needed something to believe in. Then, the world's new messiah was born. Hello, everyone. I'm Vanessa Richardson. And I'm Greg Polson. And this is Cults. Today, we'll be traveling to the frozen forests of Siberia. It's here that one of the strangest, if not most benign cults we've ever looked at, has taken root. The Church of the Last Testament. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of Parcast's other shows, wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. A lot of you have asked how you can help support the show. And if you enjoy the podcast, the best way to do that is to leave a five-star review. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast, and on Twitter at Parcast Network. The Church of the Last Testament was started in 1990, after its leader, Sergei Tarop, was reborn as Vissarion, the second coming of Christ. At its height, it may have had as many as 50,000 members, and a small faction of the church still survives to this day. The cult is peculiar in many ways. First, it doesn't push any form of violence or extreme zealotry. Second, its inhabitants are forbidden from having any negative thoughts or emotions. And third, its followers rarely leave their massive religious community in Siberia. For lack of a better phrase, they simply exist. Despite its seemingly holistic and gentle nature, the cult of the Last Testament is a doomsday cult. But while other doomsday cults contemplated mass suicide, the cult of the Last Testament functions more or less like Noah's Ark. In their opinion, the group holds the finest humans to be saved for the next age, led by their messiah, Vissarion. Like most other cult leaders, Vissarion speaks with superb biblical diction. Yet counter to the popular archetypes of cult leaders, Vissarion is very soft-spoken, almost feeble at times. But his presence is undeniable, and his cult has acquired followers from all across Europe. Yet there is little to no information regarding Vissarion himself. If Vissarion has spent half his life preaching his holistic doomsday doctrine, he spent the other half covering his tracks. Even his own followers know little about him, and only a handful have actually met him. In this episode, we'll try to crack the code of who Vissarion is, how he started the cult, and whether his plans were simply to create a religious oasis, or if he wanted to create a totalitarian system where he ruled as God. Next week, we'll follow Vissarion into the wilderness as he builds a remote village in Siberia where his followers could live in harmony and isolation on the edge of the world. While he'd eventually be known as Vissarion, savior of man, on January 14, 1961, he was born Sergei Antoilovich Torop, the son of Nadezhda and Anatoly Torop in the city of Krasnodar. Nadezhda was Sergei's mother. She had had a fairly hard life prior to raising the new messiah. She had lost both her parents at an early age and was raised in an orphanage along with her three younger sisters, Tatyana, Shineda, and Maria. 
She later got a job as a construction technician, where she met construction worker Anatoly Torop. The two soon fell in love. What's fascinating is how this story has been altered and aggrandized by the cult. For instance, according to the notes of cult chronicler Vadim Redkin, this is the story of Vissarion's parents. Quote, Once on the 14th day in January 1961, the predetermined birth took place according to the will for the great creator. End quote. The so-called report goes on to describe Nadezhda as a worthy mother who kept her purity until meeting her husband Anatoly, whose name is described as meaning to come from the Middle East. If it wasn't immediately apparent, Vissarion had a knack for revamping his life story and weaving in a biblical tone. Indeed. As we delve deeper into Vissarion's life, we'll see how he has embellished his youth to be a tragic coming-of-age tale, one where, in the end, he arrives as a holy proctor destined to save humanity. Vanessa's going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. Please note, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. The biblical parallels Vasarian draws to himself are a clear indicator of a god complex, which we've discussed at length on this show, but it also shows a need for control and a need for power, a typical trait of most cult leaders. According to Dr. Joe Navarro, writing for Psychology Today, there are 50 psychological calling cards of cult leaders, one of the most important being the claim to either having their own almighty power or having a direct connection to one. Vadim's report describes how both of Sergei's parents were pure and virtuous, which allowed for Sergei, a.k.a. Vissarion, to be born with, quote, the voice of God. More or less, his parents were blessed by his presence rather than the other way around. He believes himself to be a messiah. He's definitely pushing the Christ metaphor here. Ironic, considering both of his parents were atheists, and not just them, but the majority of Russia at the time. The Soviet Union's stance on religion during the Cold War was state-sponsored atheism. This policy of irreligion resulted from the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Since then, most religion has either been outright outlawed or heavily suppressed. The only religious organization allowed to remain mostly unscathed through the 20th century was the Russian Orthodox Church. It had long been a staple of Russian culture, dating back hundreds of years. Though after the Bolshevik Revolution, its doors were shut for fear of compromising the state. This begs the question, where did Sergei get his religious inclinations? It's possible he got them from his grandmother, Tina Torop. Tina, too, lived in Krasnodar and watched over young Sergei while he grew up. They apparently became quite close. The history of Vissarion, the church's official text, cites her multiple times throughout his upbringing— She's also cited as his main introduction to religion in general. This is stated in the Vadim reports. Quote, Grandmother Tina dignified, fulfilled Heavenly Father's will regarding her grandson. Throughout her life, she had remained faithful to the Christian faith and with great humility strove to live according to the divine truths with which she lovingly surrounded the grandson's first steps. End quote. Another interesting note is that Sergei's grandmother would take him to secret religious events. This is also mentioned within Vadim's report, saying she took Sergei to various strangers' homes where prayers were held in basements. Though unsure of what they were exactly, it's mentioned that Sergei enjoyed these rituals, noting the good and concerned relationship of the believers amongst each other. Like we mentioned earlier, the Soviet Union actively suppressed religion, so they had to practice in secret. The secrecy surrounding Christianity might have been part of what drew Sergei towards religion so strongly. That and a strong connection to his grandmother, who, by some accounts, raised him while his parents worked. Throughout his career as a cult leader in the 90s and early aughts, Sergei painted his grandmother as a saint while reinforcing his own divine providence. He wanted his followers to see his grandmother as an instrument of God, destined to guide him on his path to becoming the world's savior. I can't help but feel a certain sense of narcissism as I read these texts. Hmm, He has a definite need to feel special, or to be singled out. Dr. Navarro highlights a need to be the center of attention. Part of this could have been fostered by the society in which he grew up. At the time, individuality was frowned upon in the Soviet Union— All ambition was to be directed towards the betterment of the country, not personal gain. 
Despite the talk of pure parents and divine grandmothers, Sergei's world was anything but splendid. Around him, his country was crumbling. By 1964, Nikita Khrushchev had been ousted from power as the leader and first secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He was replaced by Leonid Brezhnev and his new collective leadership. The first few years of the Brezhnev rule were marked with desperate attempts to reform the Soviet economy, which was by all means stagnant. By 1965, Brezhnev, along with his partner Alexei Kasigin, the chairman of the Committee for the Communist Party, passed their first big initiative. It became known as the Kasigin Reform. It was designed to reform the economy such that citizens could begin to afford a basic standard of living. However, the details of the plan were confusing. It often contradicted itself and ultimately met very limited success. Besides that, some party members feared that the policy would weaken the power of the Communist Party, so they stonewalled it. Kosygin's attempt to boost the economy got caught in the crosshairs of a power struggle, and as a result, the entire union suffered. As the economy plateaued, things got worse for the Torop family. Nadezhda and Anatoly struggled to keep the family together in harsh economic times, which put a serious strain on their marriage. Sergei could do little but watch as his parents' romance fell apart. By 1968, Nadezhda and Anatoly divorced. Nadezhda got custody of the seven-year-old Sergei, and the two moved to the village of Shushinskoya to be closer to Nadezhda's younger sister, Maria. We have few details about the divorce, though in an article published in Psychology by Dr. Carl E. Pickhart, he suggests that children often lose trust in their parents and can grow anxious while being torn between the two. Also, early ideas regarding love and family can ultimately be shattered. That being said, we do have a few context clues as to what Sergei thought later on in life. In Vadim's report, the parents' divorce is described as signs of blindness due to unbelief in the great truth. Sounds like Sergei is blaming a lack of faith for why his parents split. That's the theory. Vadim writes, quote, For the first time in his present life, he had to watch the misfortune that comes from human arrogance and that leads to the breaking of the relationship of his parents, end quote. It sounds like the divorce was less about faith and more about irreconcilable differences. Vissarion is using religion as a means to vent his frustrations. Vissarion has a tendency to use religion as a means to feel seen and vindicated, and occasionally to vent a few frustrations. After his parents' divorce, Sergei's mother, Nadezhda, moved him and his sister Maria to a small village. There they lived for six months, until Nadezhda met a new man by the name of Nikolai, and moved with him to Ilyachovo for the next four years. Growing up in the new village wasn't too bad for Sergei, but he felt isolated, presumably due to an inability to connect with children his own age. Both Vadim's report and other accounts describe the young messiah as timid and socially quiet, a boy who kept to himself and struggled to relate to others. To deal with this disconnection, Sergei retreated into his imagination. According to outside sources, Sergei always talked about being famous one day. A combination of social isolation and a lack of parenting made Sergei crave attention. He wanted to be noticed. Not long after moving, Sergei received his first and only sibling, his half-sister, Irina. Irina and Sergei were inseparable, but for reasons you might not suspect. Due to Nadezhda and Nikolai's work schedules, there was little time to stay and watch the new child. So the responsibilities fell to Sergei, who was only nine years old. According to Vadim's reports, Irina came to think of Sergei as her guardian. He took her everywhere he went. The two supposedly grew close. Yet deep down, Sergei yearned for his grandmother. By the beginning of 1972, the Soviet Union had officially entered into its worst financial crisis, the era of stagnation. Due to ineffective economic reform under Brezhnev's leadership, everything fell into a slump. Labor productivity came to a standstill. Skilled workers were being paid as much as non-skilled workers who often showed up drunk and or late for work. Skilled workers demanded justice, but the government had no real solution. 
They would just transfer these problem workers from one place to another, moving their problems along with them. Russians felt that these and other policies pushed by the Brezhnev leadership were hurting the population as opposed to saving it. Divorce rates, alcoholism, mental illness, even suicide rose exponentially during the next 12 years. For a young, impressionable boy like Sergei, this must have been incredibly difficult to watch, especially when the harsh economic conditions forced them to move again when he was 11. By the summer of 1972, the family moved to the city of Krasnodar for a year, then to the city of Uzhur. It was here that Sergei reconnected with his father's family. He grew particularly close to his uncle Victor, his father's younger brother. Victor was the man who introduced Sergei to painting, which became Sergei's passion throughout the rest of his life. Sergei was especially drawn to the works of Leonardo da Vinci, both as a painter and philosopher. Sergei is described in his cult reports as an art prodigy with undeniable talent, although this becomes a common theme throughout Bedim's reports. Whatever Sergei did, he mastered and achieved greatness in no time. All this to say the quality of his artwork is probably up for debate. To borrow again from Dr. Navarro, cult leaders often see themselves as perfect and blessed and frequently express delusions of grandeur. This is usually supplemented by a need for control in some form or fashion. For Sergei, it was his narrative, how he let others perceive him. According to Navarro, by describing themselves as larger than life, cult leaders like Sergei hope people will seek him out and give them total control of their lives. This also protected Sergei from fallibility. By the end of the summer of 1975, Sergei and his family moved to Minusink, where they would remain for 14 years. Here, Sergei began high school, but this proved difficult for him. Once again, Sergei found himself withdrawing from his classmates and retreating into his own imagination. He daydreamed about being famous and found himself distracted from his schoolwork. According to Vadim's reports, this distraction came from being disinterested in class. He writes, quote, For it was not easy for many years to come into contact with knowledge that was completely unnecessary. And over time, this became more and more clear to him, end quote. Essentially, learning algebra wasn't a necessity, so he convinced himself he had an allergy to it. Licensed clinical social worker F. Diane Barth explains the very simple reason why a majority of the population daydreams about fame and fortune. Simply put, as babies, our parents dote over us and cater to our every need. But as we grow older and our needs become more complex, our parents are naturally less equipped to provide for them, even more so in cases of absent parenting. We daydream about being famous because we crave social recognition. Most people don't actually want to be famous. We've seen enough celebrity breakdowns to understand that fame isn't everything it's cracked up to be. But that doesn't stop us from fantasizing about being validated on a grand scale. He might have been the new messiah, but in this regard, Sergei was incredibly human. But not everything escaped Sergei during his teenage years. It was during high school that Sergei grew increasingly frustrated with society. As he learned more about Soviet culture and the government, he found himself not only unable to relate to the world around him, but sickened by it. He hated how spirituality was repressed without just cause, and how his fellow students cared little about the world around them. This idea of only serving the state and its corrupt rulers, rather than the world at large. Sergei found it to be selfish, if not outright toxic. For him, the idea of conforming to Soviet society was equivalent to succumbing to a disease, saying, quote, how severe the disease was that attacked the minds of the blossoming youth and caused them to move in search of a place in society for a uniform template, end quote. Sergei grew increasingly bored with school and just barely managed to graduate in 1979. Following graduation, he remained at home, struggling to figure out what he wanted to do. But over the course of the next 10 years, Sergei would transform from a disenfranchised youth to Messiah. We'll witness that transformation after this quick break. Hi, it's Vanessa and Greg. We hope you're enjoying the story on the Symbionese Liberation Army and the kidnapping of Patty Hearst. But right now, 
we want to tell you about Kopari. I never used to think about my deodorant. I just swipe and go. Did you ever worry about the ingredients you were using? Not at first. That's when I realized I needed a safer alternative. That's why I want to tell you about the aluminum-free deodorant that changed the game for me, Kopari. There are numerous potential negative side effects that aluminum can have on your body. Kopari doesn't plug up your sweat glands and cover up odor like other brands. It fights odor with plant-based actives like sage oil and coconut oil. It's also also free of silicones, sulfates, parabens, GMOs, and baking soda, so it's great for sensitive skin. No wonder it's Kopari's number one selling product. You know they can barely keep it in stock. Kopari offers a money-back guarantee, so there's no reason not to try it. Go to koparibeauty.com slash cults to make the safe switch today and save $5 off your first order when you subscribe. That's Kopari, K-O-P-A-R-I, beauty.com slash cults. Koparibeauty.com slash cults. Now back to the story. Following a childhood of isolation and disillusionment, Sergei Torop graduated high school in 1979 at age 17. Yet his destiny still eluded him. Sergei had always felt isolated, unable to relate to those around him. But in his own head, he was master of the world. He longed to be seen. As the years went on, Sergei found himself increasingly convinced that the world was corrupt, and only he had the solution to fix it. At 18, Sergei was forced to join the Red Army as part of mandatory service. He was placed into the Construction Corps and stationed in Mongolia. While his time in Mongolia is unaccounted for, Vadim's reports provide some grandiose insights. Quote, It saddened him to see the misfortunes of the people who spent their time in the slavery of this empire. How animal could be those in whose being great is hidden, but whose eyes are firmly closed? The time of this service was a heavy burden for Sergei. End quote. To translate roughly, Sergei struggled in the military. Though he never saw any combat, he was sent out on various construction projects in Mongolia. There, he bore witness to the struggles of its people under Soviet law. After two years of service in Mongolia, Sergei was discharged from the Red Army as a construction sergeant. He settled back home in Minasink with his family. Still depressed and with nowhere to turn, he retreated into his paintings for comfort. He did landscapes, portraits, anything to take his mind off his existential turmoil. By the early 80s, the Soviet economy had continued to deteriorate. The era of stagnation was at its peak, and anti-Soviet sentiments and human rights groups rallied within Russia. To quell this, Brezhnev cracked down on already limited free speech. Should anyone speak out against the government or express any anti-establishment ideals, they were sent to asylums for re-education. Maybe it was this fear of re-education that concerned Sergei's mother, Nadezhda. By the time Sergei turned 19, his mother sent him to live with his grandmother in Krasnodar, his childhood home. Sergei's grandmother, Tina, was alive, but her health waned. Regardless, Sergei was happy to be around her, and perhaps it was just the right kind of medicine he needed. He soon began doing various odd jobs, spanning from metal worker to bus driver. By most standards, this was pretty average, uneventful work. But according to Vadim's texts, Sergei mastered the art of metalworking and was downright revelatory as a bus driver. Best bus in history. The way he yielded to oncoming traffic would bring a widow to tears. In actuality, though, Sergei was somewhat of a lost soul, wanting direction. One night, while driving his bus, Sergei had the first of what would be many visions— as he drove down a lone road, he was suddenly hit with a glimpse of a pristine, beautiful valley, free from human interference. It was such a profound image that he had trouble focusing a couple of times. And for the next couple of nights, he was plagued by this same vision. These visions soon became his obsession, and he covered his entire room with paintings of beautiful, heavenly landscapes. Though he still couldn't quite comprehend what they were, or why he became so fixated on them. Perhaps this lack of focus is what cost him his jobs, as by the end of 1982, he found himself unemployed and forced to return to Minisink, where his mother and stepfather lived. Not long after that, his grandmother fell ill and died in 1984. Sergei was devastated and further retreated deep into his paintings. 
He even painted a beautiful portrait of her in honor of the love she brought him. There's no doubt that Sergei was devastated over the loss of his grandmother and may have fallen into depression. But even before her passing, Sergei was saddled with perpetual ennui. Eventually, his mother had had enough of his moping and begged him to find a job. She didn't care that he bore the emotional weight of the universe so long as he did it on the clock. This, of course, irritated Sergei. He developed a certain disdain towards his mother, possibly because she saw through his act. There's even a bit in one of Vadim's reports aimed at Sergei's mother and all those who put him down for his creative depression. He describes society as a collection of the punished and the punishers, how those who are hurting often punish others to make themselves feel better. Sergei went through a great deal of trouble to make sure no one would ever get much information about his parents to better control the narrative that he was a martyr. So while there are two sides to every story, it's a pretty safe bet that parenting Sergei was a lot to contend with. Eventually, Nadezhda finally got Sergei out of the house, thanks to one of his old classmates, who got Sergei a job working as a patrol officer on the graveyard shift in early 1984. This was actually perfect for the now 23-year-old Sergei. This meant during the daytime he could focus on his paintings and extracurricular pursuits, while at the same time pleasing the mother he viewed as overbearing. During this time, Sergei also began delving into Eastern philosophies, martial arts, and theories on the relationship between nature and man. From these, he began to develop his would-be teachings. Meanwhile, under Brezhnev, some elements of Western culture were allowed to trickle into the Soviet Union. The country underwent a major cultural shift, largely revolving around Levi's jeans and the Beatles. This didn't sit well with the KGB, who saw this as an invasion of Western ideologies designed to destroy Soviet culture. Sergei himself didn't care much for Western culture either, feeling it was just another distraction from a festering, toxic government. Yet, along with the influx of Western goods came a loosening of anti-religious sentiments. As mentioned earlier, much of the Soviet Union was ruled by state-declared atheism. But under Brezhnev, the Russian Orthodox Church gained momentum. Other minority religions were still seen as a virtual pox on society. But it was a start. By May of 1984, Sergei met a young woman by the name of Liuba. Though much of her story has been covered up by Vasaryan, what we can confirm is that she was a kindergarten teacher and dated Sergei for about six months before they married on November 2, 1984. By the autumn of 1985, they had their first child, Daria. At this point, Liuba was completely omitted from Vasaryan's texts. In fact, many people from Sergei's early life are only briefly mentioned in Vadim's report before being omitted from the rest of his story. For instance, Vasaryan's family. This could partially be an effort to keep the story centered on him. On the other hand, it may have been because, ultimately, Vasaryan's family didn't approve of what he was doing. By 1985, Russia had gone through a slew of dramatic changes. Brezhnev had died. Tensions between the U.S. and Soviet Union were worse than ever and war had broken out in Afghanistan. At the center of this, a new leader came to power, Mikhail Gorbachev. Gorbachev was idealistic and, much like his predecessor, sought to reform Russia through his radical reforms known as Perestroika and Glasnost. Perestroika sought to reform the stagnant Soviet economy by decentralizing control over businesses and removing pricing restrictions on agricultural products so that farmers could turn a profit. Meanwhile, Glasnost introduced greater freedom of speech. Both of these were introduced in 1987 with great success, though it spelled the beginning of the end for the Soviet Union. By 1988, Gorbachev called for the democratization of the USSR and launched even more radical reforms meant to reduce party control and introduce a makeshift free market economy. By the start of 1989, the Soviet Union was on its last legs. But every moment of transition feels growing pains. Much of the populace suffered. Divorce, alcoholism, and suicide all increased as people tried to cope with change. Even Sergei wasn't immune to the radically shifting society. He started drinking heavily. By 1989, despite receiving nine commendations, Sergei was fired from being a patrol officer. He had been caught drinking on the job. Devastated, Sergei decided to travel to find himself and started traversing Siberia alone, 
leaving his family behind. It was here he began to face what would be called the Three Temptations. And from these temptations came the cult leader we would soon know as Vissarion. We'll examine the birth of Vissarion right after this. Now back to the story. At 28, Sergei Torop had lost his job and all hope in the society he lived in. Dealing with intense feelings of isolation he'd had his entire life, Sergei was searching for a way to find meaning and, more importantly, find control. Thanks to his grandmother, Sergei had a strong religious upbringing. As he got older, he began to have visions of heavenly landscapes, large open fields coupled with serene mountain horizons. Something was awakening in him. But in order to realize his potential, Sergei had to go through three so-called temptations. The three temptations, according to Vadim's reports, were not so much temptations as they were three experiences that led to Sergei's great awakening as the new Messiah. The parallel Vissarion is going for here is the Bible story of Jesus' temptations in the desert, which happened directly before he began his public ministry. While no specific dates are given, the first was while wandering the Ural Mountains near the city of Perm after losing his job in 1989. It was here that he questioned whether man could find true salvation and what that would look like. The second came while at a rest stop traveling back home. He looked at how buildings encroached on the wilderness and wondered why man couldn't live in harmony with nature. Sergei desired to find a better way. The final temptation came with the Abakan church and his rage against organized religion. After touring the Ural Mountains, Sergei was contacted by the Abakan Church's minister, called only Olympias in Vadim's report. Apparently, Olympias had seen some of Sergei's work and wanted to commission him to paint three portraits of saints for the church. Sergei met with Olympias, and while there, was baptized as a show of good faith to the church. This was said to be an awakening for Sergei, as Vadim's report states, quote, Something related and wonderful awoke more and more in his heart when looking at various images of saints that had been recorded at different times by human hands." End quote. Following the baptism, Sergei was given half of his stipend for the pictures and set to work. He hoped to use the money to take his family on vacation to Krasnodar to meet the rest of his estranged family. But things did not turn out that way. Sergei painted the three pictures, though he didn't necessarily follow the instructions given to him. Though in the cult's report, the problem was entirely Olympias' fault. He just simply couldn't fathom the sheer beauty of Sergei's work. This proved to be the last straw. Sergei refused to fix the portraits, believing them to be perfect. He was forced to return the money he was given, and his family was left to wallow. They had already been struggling with money for the past six years, but things seemed especially bad now. Meanwhile, Russia was going through growing pains as it shifted from communism to democracy. Thanks to perestroika and glasnost, much of the old Soviet dark secrets were being spilled out into the public. People were demanding change. Soon, Soviet satellite states began to declare their independence from the Soviet Union. And by February of 1991, six republics had broken away. Revolution was in the air. Still upset over the paintings, Sergei fell into yet another depression, until one fateful day in May 1990. Sergei was watching TV when he saw a report of people destroying headstones and ransacking churches. The violent imagery struck a chord with him. He said, quote, I saw a program on television that showed lots of destroyed churches and headstones, and this prompted me into action. Everything in me came out like a storm, I had this great thirst to transform everything in the world so that there wasn't so much grief. My understanding was that humankind really must start to live in a different way. A person must lose the capability to think about bad things, and I know how to teach people to do this, so people who follow my word are able to live for the better." End quote. This is when Sergei had his great religious awakening. It was here he decided to become a religious teacher and philosopher, and more importantly, start his own religion. The question was, how? Then it hit him. He said, quote, 
I know the entire law of human development and the root of mistakes in human society. People are very, very scared of each other, and in order to unite them, we have to think up a system that must do away with any egotistical thoughts. I'm the one who needs to form the future of mankind. End quote. Just like that, he decided he was the Messiah. Though he never explicitly stated that he made up being Jesus, it certainly implied that this was a more creative revelation than a moment of divine intervention. But becoming a Messiah was exactly what he always wanted, in a way. First, it fulfilled his need for spirituality passed down by his grandmother. Second, it gave him power and attention, basically a way to establish his own way of life free from the scrutiny of his mother or wife. And third, it ultimately gave him control over others. He found a way to save others and serve himself. And with that decision made, Sergei had to come up with a name. In the end, he chose to take up the mantle of Visarion, meaning he who gives life. Over the next year, he developed his new religion and began to experiment with his new persona, that of the second coming of Christ. At the dawn of the 90s, the Soviet Union was all but extinct. What remained of the once global superpower had been split into 11 independent states. Freedom's long thought lost had returned after almost 75 years. Free speech, free press, science, and religion. Russia, and its surrounding satellite states for that matter, had long been deprived of religion and faith. But with the Soviet Union's assured dismantling, People were hungry for spirituality in some form, and sure enough, they got it, thanks to the policy Glasnost. Glasnost opened the doors to a Russian Great Awakening, if you will. The Russian Orthodox Church's popularity skyrocketed, and other minority faiths, such as Judaism and Islam, also crept out of the shadows. However, this freedom was a double-edged sword. As the government struggled to rebuild itself, a sort of manifest destiny rose up within Russia, as New Age religions and cults forced their way in. By 1991, over 13,000 new religions were registered in Russia. Soon there were too many for the Russian authorities to handle, which may have been a blessing in disguise for Vissarion, who was able to wander around Russia dressed as Jesus, virtually under the radar. Sergei Torop had just found his calling as the new Messiah. No longer was he a simple peasant, but Vissarion, the giver of life. Sergei, who we will now call Vissarion, had been working the past year to develop his new faith. For most of his mythology, he looked to the Russian Orthodox Church and the Bible, but he also looked at Hinduism, Buddhism, and other Eastern philosophies. It seems like his goal was to create a religion that would allow harmonious living between man and nature, while at the same time making him the center of attention, fulfilling a long desire to feed his ego and supplement his lack of confidence. The problem was, how could he compete against 13,000 other religions? That's when Vissarion's religion took a dark turn. Vissarion swore an apocalypse was coming. In it, all of man would be wiped out. Only a select few will survive. He doesn't get more specific than that publicly. Of course, those who followed Vasarian's teachings would be saved and allowed a place in the new age. But to further draw people in, Vasarian had to develop his persona, a mythos beyond just a doomsayer. That's when he once again turned to the Bible. Vasarian declared himself a reincarnation of Jesus Christ, come back to earth to save his sheep by teaching a brand new doctrine. He also began to dress like Jesus, with long white or black robes and a shawl. He grew his hair long and sported a beard to match. It's unclear as to whether or not he truly believed he was Jesus Christ, but he certainly played the part very well. A smart choice. Even if you aren't familiar with Christianity, most are familiar with Jesus Christ. By basing his persona around this, he gave people something well-known to grasp onto. Think of it like a gateway drug that leads followers deeper into his clutches. But rather than teaching Christianity, Vissarion teaches an amalgamation of different religions, including Hinduism, Buddhism, and even paganism. In his mind, the goal is not only to save humanity, but to unite all religions under one faith, a faith he would eventually call the Community of United Faith. 
With both the look and feel of Jesus down, Vissarion began to travel across Siberia and Russia to preach his word. He made his first public appearance in the town of Minisink on August 18, 1991. He spoke in a small town square to a crowd of 33 people. This choice of date may not have been by accident either. As Vissarion spoke, the old guard of the Soviet Union staged a coup hoping to prevent the signing of a treaty that would convert the Soviet Union into a federation of independent republics. But the populace rose up and helped to squash the coup in a matter of days. It was over on August 21st, 1991. Vissarion took advantage of the chaos. Preying upon people's fear of change and desire for spirituality, he approached people with a quiet, comforting countenance. He offered them salvation, but only if they followed his word. He provided stability and definitive answers in a time of unrivaled uncertainty. People responded. On Christmas Day, 1991, Gorbachev resigned and declared his office extinct and handed power to Russia's new president, Boris Yeltsin. The sickle and hammer were taken down from the Kremlin, and the Russian bars replaced them. It was the dawning of a new era for Russia, and with it came the rise of cultism. Meanwhile, Vissarion's movement gained speed and popularity, with hundreds of followers already flocking around him. But those first few years weren't without their hardships. In August of 1992, Vissarion was attacked by a random pedestrian for claiming he was Jesus. The attacker managed to get away, and Vissarion was relatively unharmed, aside from a few bruises. The accost didn't stop there. As 1992 dragged on, Vissarion began to attract the attention of the Russian Orthodox Church, who condemned his activities. This was mostly due to the fact that he claimed to be Jesus Christ and was preaching ideas outside the Bible. More surprisingly, Vissarion and his community were attacked by another popular cult at the time, the White Brotherhood. The White Brotherhood was a very popular doomsday cult and featured its own messiah, a woman named Marina Svigun. She, too, was the embodiment of God. Unlike Vissarion, the White Brotherhood was already enjoying immense popularity with around 1,000 members. To them, Vissarion and his community were just posers in the way of their path to salvation. Through the rest of 1992, the White Brotherhood barricaded Vissarion and his followers outside of his lectures and threatened members with acts of violence. To make matters worse, the Russian Orthodox Church also continued to clamp down on them. By January of 1993, the young cult leader had a new idea. What if he could create a community separate from the rest of the world, his own personal utopia where followers could live free and above all else, live under his rule? Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. Join us next Tuesday as we continue delving into the bizarre journey of Vissarion as he grows his cult. We'll also look more in depth at the teachings of Vissarion, including his Bible, the Last Testament, and other strange literature. Some of you have asked how you can help the show. If you enjoy Cults, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. You can find Cults and all of Parcast podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or on your favorite podcast directory. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Michael Langsner, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro, Paul Mahler, Maggie Admire, and Carly Madden. Cults is written by Michael Pindus and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. <laughs>